for coming. Um, I'm Dr. Debbie Budd, president here at Berkeley City College, and we are thrilled you're, you are joining us either here in our tiered lecture hall or virtually. Um, before I introduce our guest, I would like to um, say a very uh, great thank you to Dr. Fabian Vanga for helping organize this event, as well as uh, Justin Hoffman, who has also assisted with this. Um, we are here at Berkeley City College, um, which has been in this building since 2006. We serve about 7,500 students per term, and we are very proud of the work that we do with our career technical education, with our transfer to the UC and the CSUs, as well as assistance with the foundational skills. So. Um, I really want to get us started this morning uh, with our speaker, but I want to do just a couple of shout outs for the work that our faculty and staff do. Um, being just one block away from UC Berkeley, we pride ourselves on having the highest acceptance rate to UC Berkeley. Um, this year, over a hundred of our students will be, uh, have been accepted to UC Berkeley and uh, many students are also transferring to the CSUs. Uh, recently, many people may not know, the state developed associate degrees for transfer. When students take one of, we currently have 11 uh, degrees that qualify, if they get a 2.0, they get automatic acceptance into a CSU. Um, in addition, we have incredible multimedia programs. We have students that come in that are already in the field, that hone their skills, improve their careers, and go on to uh, greatness. And uh, then we have great faculty that are always looking at innovative ways to outreach to the community and really look at what's happening in the world. And I'm looking forward to our panel discussion as well as our uh, guest today. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Audrey Waters, who is a writer who worked in the education field for the past 15 years as a graduate student, college instructor, and program manager for an ed tech nonprofit. Although two chapters into her comparative literature dissertation, Audrey decided to abandon academia and show how happily, and she now happily fulfills the one job recommended by her junior aptitude test freelance writer. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Edutopia, Mindshift, Fast Company, Inside Higher Ed, The School Library Journal, O'Reilly Radar, Read Write Web, Campus Technology, and The Huffington Post, in addition to her own blog, Hack Education. She is an editor and lead writer for Educating Modern Learners, and she is also currently working on a book called Teaching Machines, due out in 2014. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very excited to, uh, to be here today um, to talk to you a little bit um, uh, about some of the thoughts that I, um, that I have surrounding robots, um, education technology, and the work of education itself. Um, and it's interesting to me because I think one of the things that I'm noticing right now is that um, there's this idea, and it's becoming more and more pervasive, that the real reason that you would go to school is to gain the skills that you would need to find a good job. The purpose of education, and that's at the K-12 level, at community college, higher education writ large, is becoming couched in terms about job training and career readiness. And there's a growing backlash, I think, against the liberal arts and against the humanities. The president, of course, sneered at art history majors. Um, Florida Governor Rick Scott suggests suggested that we charge people who study philosophy and anthropology more to go to college. One of the gubernatorial candidates here in California wants to make college free for people who major in STEM degrees as long as they are willing to give a proportion of their future earnings 
um, an undetermined portion of their future earnings back to the state. Um, but my background, I confess, actually is in the humanities. Um, I write about education and technology for a living, but I've never an attended a school of education or an engineering school or um, a business school. I have no formal academic training in those, in those areas. But what I do have is an interdisciplinary undergraduate degree and a master's degree in folklore. And I am a PhD candidate for life <laughs> um, in, in a comparative literature. I'm an academic dropout. Um, but I do have a love of storytelling and many years of training in literature and language. And as such, I think, I think a lot, I spend a lot of time thinking about narratives, thinking about the stories that we tell, and the stories that we tell about education, the stories that we tell about technology, um, the stories that we tell about our culture. And I suppose that probably makes me wildly unemployable in many people's eyes. Um, just as likely, I suppose, it makes me incredibly critical. Um, and I'd like to imagine the way in which perhaps those of us trained in the humanities do, that that sort of wild criticism also makes me incredibly dangerous. But I'm not really sure about that. Um, of course, and it is the sort of recovering literary scholar in me that means that when I want to talk to you today about education, technology, mm -hmm. I'm compelled to sort of invoke a piece of literature to sort of start the conversation. Um, this is Carol Chapik, um, or this is a scene from his play, um, from 1920. He, or his brother Joseph at least, coined the term robot. For the play Rossum's Universal Robots, um, the word comes from the Czech roboti, which means surf labor, uh, drudgery, another translation suggests. Wikipedia also uh, argues that this means the amount of hours a surf owns his master in a given day. The robots in this play, they aren't sort of the metallic creatures that we think about with robots um, in, in popular culture today. Um, they're biological. They're actually assembled from this protoplasm-like substance. Um, in the play's first act, a woman named Helena goes to the island where the robots are being assembled or manufactured. Um, she's, she's there as part of the League of Humanity. And she wants to make an argument that the robots have a soul. And as such, they should be freed. The robots, they work faster. They work cheaper than humans. Actually, the robots aren't paid at all in the play. Um, they, but they have, in this world, quickly taken over all aspects of work. Robots remember everything. They don't like anything. Quote, they would make great university professors, says Harry Dolman, the general manager of the factory that makes the robots. So as the play progresses, the robots dominate all aspects of the economy. The robots take over all the jobs. And the human birth rate plummets. The robots stage a rebellion. It's a global rebellion. They're universal robots. The robots all sort of have a shared political affinity, and they have a shared language. Um, they recognize the universality of their labor str struggles, that none of them are pay paid, that they all share sort of the outcome together. So hoping to stop this economic and political crisis, Helena actually burns the recipe that allows people, that allows humans to build robots. But the robots kill all the humans, with the exception of one man who still works in the factory with his hands. Then the robots discover that without the formula, they can't actually uh, recreate themselves. And one of the robots laments at the end that the machines are churning out nothing but bloody chunks of meat. So Chubbuck's play was translated into nearly 30 languages, and it was wildly successful in the 1920s when it, when, it was first, when it first came out. And the success of the play comes, no doubt, because the 1920s were a moment of sort of great anxiety about work, about industrialization, 
about revolution, about war, about sort of the ways in which all of these things were sort of shaping and perhaps threatening our humanity. The, and that's the question I think that robots always force us to ask, right? As we mechanize and now these days digitize more and more of our world, what happens to our humanity? This question that Helena was so convinced that the robots have, soul, have souls, what happens in a world that's being automated to human work, to human labor, to love, and to our soul? Are we poised to find ourselves as becoming these bloody chunks of meat? Of course, there are definitely those that, are, that hope that, um, that argue that automation will make the world more efficient, the automation will save us, or at least will save the corporation's money. There are those that access, suggest that automation is inevitable, right? We are entering a new phase of world history, one with which we will have fewer and fewer workers to produce the goods and services we need. That's the argument in the book called Race Against the Machine. Before the end of the century, says Wired Magazine, 70% of, of today's occupations will be replaced by automation. The Economist offers a more rapid timeline. It suggests that nearly half of all American jobs will be automated in a decade or two. So these technologies that these authors point to, they might be new, right? The self-driving car, automated libraries, high-speed trading, mechanized operating rooms. But their arguments, their arguments about the coming age of robots are not new. That's something that Chapek's play sort of demonstrates to us. This is a fear that we've had for over 100 years now. This idea that we have hopes and fears about the implications of labor-saving devices. What is that going to mean to our, and, and the ways in which the hopes and fears about labor-saving devices are often inextricably connected to our hopes and fears about labor itself. Which jobs are going to be automated? Why? Right. We can't answer these, these questions by saying that, oh, it's simply the jobs that are the easiest to automate. It's really not easy to automate a, a robot that performs surgery. It's not easy to automate a drone that does airstrikes. We pursue the automation of certain jobs, I think, because they're routine heavy. Sure, that's what, that's what the computer scientists will tell us, right? Anything that has that has a routine to it can be quite easily automated. But we also pursue the, the automation of certain jobs because we don't want humans to do them. We're concerned about humans that do them. We automate certain tasks at first within jobs, but then we find that the workplace changes around those jobs. <coughs> we pursue the automation because we find that some workplace environments, we believe that they should be more controlled more programmed, more regulated. We want them to be more efficient. Perhaps we want a more docile workforce. And I think as such, robots always raise these questions about the ways in which work is embodied and labored, excuse me, engendered in certain ways that reflect what we value, whose work is valued, again, and why. That makes the automation of education really interesting to me. And I think, I mean, particularly frightening, but, uh, but, but fascinating. Because you always hear, you often hear politicians and venture capitalists and engineers and technologists say, oh, no, 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 no. We don't really want robots to replace teachers. We're simply going to use technology to sort of enhance the work that teachers already do. Well, I mean, actually, you do find in some circles, in some places, um, people who write and say, yeah, actually the plan is to replace teachers with technology. But rarely in public do you sort of hear politicians and, and, and technologists sort of state that so, so bluntly. But we see a lot of tools being developed um, to automate, again, automate in certain tasks within education, adaptive learning software, automated grading tools. And the proponents of these tools they want to, um, I think they want to be able to assess and engineer the classroom again in ways to make it more efficient. 
sort of people decry schools today as being based on a factory model. It's a very sort of well-known sort of condemnation about schools. But it often, in many ways, the technologies that are being developed are simply sort of designed to make that factory upgraded, to run a little bit more so efficiently, so that the students that move through the factory perhaps can do so at their own pace, as though that's sort of some sort of liberatory change to the factory itself. I think, again, some of these technologies, they boast that they're cutting edge. They say that they're, um, they're sort of, there's new technologies, new breakthroughs, but, but I think the politics and the business around them, and even the ideology around them, tr are actually quite old. Um, they're not new. The drive, in fact, to create teaching machines, I think, is really a dominant trend throughout much of the 20th century. We can trace some of these early efforts, actually, to automate education back even before Carol Chappick came up with, a, with the term robot. Um, a patent in 1866 for a device that would teach spelling, the first patent for a teaching machine. Or a patent in 1909 for a device to teach reading. A patent in 1911 awarded to Herbert Aikens that promised to teach, quote, arithmetic, reading, spelling, foreign languages, history, geography, literature, or any other subject in which questions can be asked in such a way to demand a definite form of words, letters, or symbols. <coughs> we can trace these efforts to automate education back to Sidney Pressey, a machine that he developed in the 1920s. He was a psychologist at Ohio State University, and around 15, 1915, he came up with this idea that we should be able to automate the way in which um, the, the, the machine, we should be able to make a machine that would automate the scoring of the intelligence testing that the military was using to sort of assess recruitment possibilities. Um, the World War I happened, there was some delay in his research, but he exhibited his first teaching machine at a 1925 meeting of the American Psychological Association. It had four multiple choice test, uh, questions and answers in a window, four keys. So if you thought the second answer was the correct one, you'd press the second button. And if you got it right, a light would come on. If you got it wrong, you could keep pressing until you came up with the right answer. And the, the machine would record all of the data about your attempts to answer them. So, I mean, intelligence testing based on students' responses to multiple choice questions, multiple choice questions with four or five answers, automated grading and data collection. See, this stuff has a very old history. <coughs> Harvard professor B.F. Skinner claimed that he'd never actually heard of Sidney Sydney Pressey's machine when he came up with his own teaching teaching machine in the mid-1950s. And he actually argued that Sidney Pressey's machine wasn't a real teaching machine, it was only a testing machine. Press, or Skinner wanted to do something else. Skinner didn't like multiple choice questions, for example, so his machine allowed students to sort of write by hand um, responses, or they could sort of enter their own responses and then would pull a series of, of levers. And a correct answer, again, meant a light would go on. So Skinner was a very well-known behaviorist, and he felt that this sort of positive reinforcement was key to shaping behavior. And all human actions, he argued, could be analyzed this way. He argued that despite their important role in helping shape behavior, quote, as a mere reinforcing mechanism, the teacher is out of date. And again, so it's worth asking, when we seek to automate education, when we seek to automate certain tasks, whose work do we decide? How do we decide who is out of date? For us, I think Skinner's machine probably looks a little out of date. And the history around this, it really shapes so much of what we see today. Even though there's new hardware, even though there's new software, even though the machines that we use don't, don't look like record players, with pieces, of, uh, with, with pieces of paper stringing through them. But I think that many of the things, self-paced learning, gamification, emphasis on real-time or near real-time response, these are all things that you can trace back to Skinner. And that's because, of course, of course education and education technology, and even technology in some ways, really draw heavily on Skinner's work and on his friend and co or his colleague, 
um, Edward Thorndike. They have been incredibly influential on how we think about teaching and learning. They're the incredibly influential on how we think about testing and, of course, how we construct schooling. And this isn't something, again, that just affects K through 12 schools. When we talk about the kinds of jobs that will be automated, I think you could argue that education will be safe, right? Education is, after all, about human relationships, and you can't really automate relationships. You could argue that education is based on an ethic of care, and that humans are better than machines at caring for other humans. But I think the work of, of Skinner and Thorndike suggests that there are, this isn't really the prominent, necessarily the predominant way that we think about education, right? That we think about the work that actually happens in education. I think that these, that rather than seeing learning as a process of human inquiry, or discovery or connection to other humans, the focus becomes on content delivery, and content delivery certainly can be automated. Again, let me turn back to popular culture and science fiction. And I, I think it's important to think about science fiction because it really isn't, I mean, it all sort of comes, science fiction and the work of scientists and technologists, they are born of the same culture. Um, I think that it's important to think of, you know, entrepreneurs and playwrights and engineers. We construct stories and we construct metaphors and we actually construct tools um, sort of out of, of a shared understanding. The, really, the, the things that happen, you know, the things that happen in a, in a movie studio aren't necessarily so far apart than what happens at a programmer's terminal. And the, these ideas do cross-pollinate heavily. And I think that it's fascinating to me. It's always really interesting and, again, sort of horrifying to, 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 listen to, some to listen to technologists talk and to recognize that the way in which they understand education looks a lot more like this than it does any sort of experience that I've ever seen or had in the classroom. There's very much this idea that education is a content delivery system, right? I mean, it appears all the time in their press releases, but it appears oftentimes in, in movies in popular culture as well. Again, one of my favorite scenes, probably one of the greatest um, moments in Keanu Reeves' um, stellar career as an actor is that moment when he, in The Matrix, has knowledge delivered directly into his spinal column, and he utters with such profundity, whoa, I know kung fu, right? And that's, that's the image that people strive for, that ability that we're just going to somehow be able to directly implant information into students' heads, and it will be efficient and wonderful, drive a lot of the work of folks who are working in, edu or in education technology, I should say. <laughs> Actually, I mean, and it comes in weird places too. This year at the MIT, uh, or excuse me, this year at the TED Talk, the MIT Media Lab um, co-founder, Nicholas Negroponte actually got up on stage and said that in the future, in a few years' time, we're going to be able to take pills, learning pills, and ingest learning pills, and we'll be able to literally ingest information. You'll be able to swallow a learning pill so that knowledge can be directly delivered to your brain. This is a guy at MIT. <laughs> Nicholas Negroponte. This isn't like, this isn't, yeah. Nicholas Negroponte said you could be able to swallow a learning pill and the information will go directly into your brain. You will be able to learn English instantly. You will be able to ingest all of Shakespeare's work. Now, yeah. <laughs> that is some seriously speculative bullshit right there. <laughs> said on the TED Talk stage. But bullshit or not, like this is actually the sort of long-running plot of, of the sort of ideology that runs through this idea that we're going to be able to automate education. It's connected, it's a long-standing goal of artificial intelligence, I think. This idea that we can create these AI-backed machines that are going to be able to automate and personalize education for us. I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting that the founders of the three major MOOC um, initiatives come from an AI background. Sebastian Trun, Andrew Ng, Daphne Kohler are from the AI lab at Stanford, and Ant Agrawal worked at the AI lab at, at, at MIT. 
And I think that, that of course, the AI in MOOCs is, is uh, not really there yet, um, despite, despite the background. It's really still based on multiple choice assessments. Um, they're, they rarely seem to pay attention to the data that all of us are generating there. I don't know about you, but I often get the emails saying, congratulations on making it to week five of the MOOC when I've never actually logged in a single time. <laughs> or they say, based on your MOOC experiences, perhaps you'd like to sign up for this horse and uh, sign, in, uh, sign up for a course in horse biology. And I think, what have I done to ever suggest to you that I care about equine biology? Um, but there we go. That's the future of AI in MOOCs, perhaps. Um, but actually, in, 19, in 2012, the Hewlett Foundation decided that they were really interested in the way in which AI could, Im influence, could influence education. They wanted the best minds in the world in AI, in machine learning, which is an interestingly named section of AI, to, to come up with a way, to pro a programmatic way to automate the grading of essays. Not the grading of multiple choice questions, but the grading of essays. So they offered a $100,000 bounty to, to, for people to be able to design an algorithm to grade as well as humans. And they said it was a success. They gave out the money. They said not only is it, po is it possible to automate the grading of essays, but we've come up with an algorithm that shows that machines do it just as well as humans do. Robots grade more efficiently. Robots, unlike those pesky adjunct instructors, don't unionize. They don't demand health care benefits. They don't demand a living wage. A computer can grade 16,000 SAT essays in 20 seconds, I've heard. And if teachers don't have to grade papers, they can assign more papers, right? If teachers don't have to grade papers they, papers, they can have more students in their classrooms, hundreds of thousands of students even. Of course, not everyone is really excited about this idea of robot essay graders. Um, MIT's Les Perelman has been a, um, a longtime critic of automated essay grading. He's actually written a piece of software called the Basic Automatic BS Essay Language Generator, or Babel. <laughs> which is designed, designed to auto-generate essays to fool the auto-graders. Um, and it's actually quite easy to fool. Well, I mean, easy. I, mean, I couldn't write the, I couldn't write the software. But it's, it's, sort of, it's not that difficult to fool the software because robot, the robot essay graders, they look at certain things. They don't actually sort of read the paper. They don't read the way humans do. But they look at things like word frequency, word length, punctuation usage, use of conjunctions. They look at how many commas you've done, the words that you've done together. So they, they award a grade that's based on the grade that similar essays have been awarded. So you could argue that an automated, uh, automated essay grading functions about as, a human as, about as good as a human grader. But then I think you're also arguing something else. And this is something that writing professor Alex Reed has argued. So sort of if computers can read as well as people, that means that we have actually been training people to read like computers. And I think that that's, that's a really important thing to think about in this, in this, in this, um, in this as well. In the Hewlett Foundation um, competition, the, the robots were being compared to the workers who'd been hired by the major testing companies to grade papers for them. And of course, they, they hire a range of people to grade these essays. You'll often find help wanted ads on Craigslist to get part-time jobs at Pearson, for example. Um, Todd Farley's book, Making the Grade, My Misadventures in the Standardized Testing Industry, is a really interesting look at sort of behind the scenes at the human graders that purportedly the robots outwork. He wrote, from my first day in the standardized testing industry until my last day, I have watched those assessments be scored with rules that are alternately ambiguous, arbitrary, superficial, and bizarre. I have watched the open-ended questions on large-scale assessments be scored by temporary employees who could be described as uninterested or unintelligent, apathetic, or unemployable. That, I'm afraid, is the dirty little secret of the standardized testing industry that the people hired to read and score um, student responses to standardized tests are, for the most part, people that aren't hired elsewhere. It's a pretty damning indictment, 
particularly when we look at the way in which standardized tests weight so heavily on, on um, the out, uh, are sort of looked at as being so incredibly important. I think it tells us a lot about when we look at the labor and the perceived value, its real value of the labor that goes into this multi-billion dollar testing industry. Right? What does this tell us behind the impetus behind automation too? Right? Again, whose work do we value? What work do we automate and why? What, it, what does it tell us about sort of the everyday labor that goes into grading? Of course, because the people that grade standardized tests aren't everyday labor. They're specifically hired for this task. They aren't the teachers that work every day with students. They aren't the teachers that have a personal understanding or a personal relationship with students. Right? These graders, the graders from the standardized test industry, are given a very strict rubric to follow. They're told not to deviate. They're told not to recognize creative expression. So no wonder a robot does that better. No wonder an algorithm is superior. An algorithm, a robot doesn't know what creative expression even looks like. An algorithm can follow a rubric a lot better than a human. That's what they're programmed to do. But what does it mean when we tell our students that we don't value their work or that we're not actually going to read it, but we're going to hand it over to a computer to read? Right? A computer's going to analyze what they say. What happens when we encourage students to express themselves in such a way that the computer really likes it, that the human doesn't necessarily enjoy it? What does it mean when we tell our students that their audience is a robot? What happens when we discourage them from, from thinking about creative expression and instead encourage them to respond to algorithms? Robot graders, I think, raise sort of lots of questions about thinking machines and teaching machines, about self-expression, about creativity, about the purpose of writing, about the purpose of education, about the purpose of education technology, the ethics of education technology, and the work that I think robots are being trained to do within this field. And this isn't really just about writing assessment either, although that's what I, I'm, I sort of care most about having taught writing for a number of years. Um, this is happening all over in other fields as well. At the Math Emporium at Virginia Tech, for example, there are no, there are no math professors for the first year writing class. Instead, the students go into a large room with 8,000 students, can sit in front of computers and work their way through automated um, math software. No professors. There are some tutors, but again, these raise questions about academic labor. What does that look like? You know, what happens in these circumstances to pedagogy? What happens to research? What are the implications, again, for academic, for academic work? What are the implications for our students? What are the implications when we automate the testing and the teaching process? What do we want? Do we want a messy, open-ended, creative process? Or do we want that to be standardized? Right? Do we want that to be circumscribed so that we can scale it, so that we can automate it? What sort of society are we trying to engineer? What does all of this work in artificial intelligence prompt us to think about human intelligence? What will, make, what will it drive us to think about human relationships, particularly the relationships that we work on in education. In 1962, Raymond Callahan published this book called Education and the Cult of Efficiency. And it's a very dry book, but it's an important book. And he looked at the ways in which, at the turn of the, at the in the early 1900s, the sort of effort to bring Taylorism into education. He looked at all of the people, sort of this rise of a business, sort of the business lens to think about what happens in education. And he observed that when we talk about making education work more efficiently, it's never about science, and it's never about learning. It's actually just simply about saving money. He said that those that were charged with making schools run more efficiently were found to devote their attention by applying the scientific method to really the financial outcomes and the mechanical outcomes of school. A couple of years later, Jocko Lull, wrote a book called The Technological Society, and he too identified efficiency as something that was really driving, driving society. It was becoming this all-encompassing, all sort of dominant force 
um, in, our, in our technological age. And this is chilling, I think. The human brain must be made to conform to the much more advanced brain of the machine. And education will no longer be an unpredictable and exciting adventure in human enlightenment, but an exercise in conformity and an apprenticeship to whatever gadgetry is useful in a technological world. You know, thinking about Rossum's Universal Robots again, what use will a technical, technical world have for our students? What use will it have for us? One more literary reference, one that unlike Rossum's Universal Robots and Matrix doesn't end up with the machines killing us all, and that's Isaac Asimov, The Three Laws of Robotics. Right. So, this was his idea that robots don't actually have to be engineered to destroy us. That as their creators, we can sort of program them to respond differently. So the three robots, a robot may, the three laws, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and second laws. And this is my favorite. This is my favorite. The zeroth law. A robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. But see, we've never formulated three laws of ed tech robotics, right? We've never really had a conversation about the ethics and the implications of technology. We don't really ask. We don't really ask those questions because we're so driven, I would say, by sort of this quest for efficiency. Mostly we want to know, is the technology going to raise test scores? And that's really about the end of the questions that we ask for the implications of what we're doing. We don't actually ask, are we building tools that might harm humanity? that might destroy humanity. And I think that, of course, that's sort of some <coughs> nice science fiction hyperbole, right? You know, is this idea that we're sort of building these machines that are going to destroy the human race because we're all taking MOOCs? I don't know, whatever. I mean, that's, I get that that's sort of a pushing, pushing the sort of idea a, a little far, perhaps. But I think, I think it's still worth thinking about, sort of when it comes to our humanity. Because education, this process of teaching and learning, this human relationship that one has with our students is an incredibly important part of our humanity. What are we engineering away? What are we doing when we sort of dis disregard the work, the labor, the intellectual labor, and the emotional labor that goes into teaching and learning? I'm not sure if it would be useful to devise sort of three laws of ed tech robotics. That's probably the literature person in me um, speaking more so than, than any sort of politician or technologist or business person would sort of frown greatly at that. But I think that it's important that we do deliberate a lot more vigorously about the ethics, ethics and the consequences of the technologies that we are adopting. See, because I think that this goal of building teaching machines, like I said, has been something that we have been sort of driving towards for a very long time. This idea that we can automate education. But I don't think that doing so is necessarily progress, right? And I think that we need to really think about what is our vision of the future? What is our vision of education of the future? Because either we think, either I think those of us that work in education talk about what our vision is, or this discussion is going to happen, I think, without us. What do these new technologies mean for us? What is our ethical approach to technology? I mean, if we don't have these conversations, someone else will. And unfortunately, it's probably not going to be someone who comes from the humanities. Thank you. For those that uh, don't know Audrey, they will think that she's coming from a cabin, probably Mendocino, <laughs> and hate technology. And she's very deep in technology. Actually, we met through yeah. these kind of beautiful groups. Um, and I think uh, that would, would be like a footnote that I should add for those who don't know you. But we have 10 minutes. Okay. So we have 10 minutes.
for questions. So if someone wants to ask a question, I will pass the microphone. To paraphrase a, uh, uh, and I don't recall the, uh, the writer at the time, but uh, efficiency is the bugaboo of mediocre minds. <laughs> there is efficiency and there is efficiency. Uh, what do we do with the displaced labor? How do we give them the resources to maintain a reasonable and fruitful life when we take human work away from them? I would suggest we do not need to, uh, to automate education, but to return it to humans and create a large workforce of educators and students. Since the robots are doing the mediocre tasks for us, this frees us up to enjoy ourselves in education. Thank you. Comments? <laughs> Well, to address that question, it would be interesting to look at what happened with agriculture in this country. Mm -hmm. Because, um, <clears throat> as you know, with the Green Revolution, with the advent of industrial agriculture, uh, labor saving and land saving technologies were, the, uh, were the, uh, the main strategies. To the point that we have 2% of the population in this country that are farming. And there was a huge displacement of small farmers to the point now that we have an average age of a farmer 64 years old in this country, and the youth is, is not going to go back to farming. And, and there's no, um, even if they wanted to, they don't have access to land because of the price. So uh, that's an interesting, I think, um, way of seeing what would happen if we automate education here. What would happen with all that labor force? I think there's some interesting parallels between, uh, between the two. You suggested that um, it, that this conversation here is going on among the AI and the technological people, and that the alternate conversation, which would be about the um, for whom, for and for what purpose education is, needs to happen somewhere else. What other venues do you know of where that conversation is happening, and can you tell us a little bit about the health of that conversation? I think that this is this is. I mean, I'm glad. I'm glad actually that Fabi noted that I'm sort of not. Um, I'm not a luddite. And, um, I actually think that one of the powerful things that technology has given to us is the web. And I think that the web has enabled us to make to help sort of um, expand human connections so that we can connect with one another and learn from one another. Um, and I would say that although I think it's very hard, it's very hard to sort of work against some of the louder conversations, particularly those conversations that are sort of backed with a lot more financial and political oomph, um, I would say that the conversations about what does the vision look like of technology are certainly um, happening on the web. I think that people are building affinities elsewhere, um, building affinities with one another elsewhere, and if nothing else, sort of recognizing that this isn't simply one, you know, this isn't simply one campus experiencing pressure, this isn't simply one discipline um, experiencing pressure, that this is something that I think um, many of us are recognizing in, in sort of multiple places. So I would say that, you know, I think that it's happening online, ironically perhaps, is that we're, we're sort of having these other alternate conversations and we can have them now because we can sort of, through social media, we can sort of, or through, you know, publishing through blogs, we can, we can sort of state our, you know, make our analyses, state our claims, without having to go through sort of the official channels um, of, of mainstream, you know, mainstream publications and mainstream power. Could I respond yes. to that? I'll be brief. Um, and that's great, and I would like to know more about those details. I think another place where it's happening is in um, where adjuncts are organizing, yeah. which is means on the ground and often without um, a whole lot of web savvy. But like the people who are around AFT 2121 in San Francisco trying to defend the city college against disaccreditation, and the SEIU efforts over here to do a metro strategy and organizing among pri private higher education, they're 
in places like that, you can find an effort to create a discipline-based academic labor movement. Mm -hmm. Hi, Audrey. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about um, the possibility of decoupling education from institutions and if technology might be the vehicle by which institutions themselves would be purely administrative and the pedagogy would migrate to a kind of self-organized or um, pop-up or uh, informal sector. So, um, I, I just wondered about that kind of, uh, you know, s uh, slightly also science fiction, but that the institutions become different than sites of learning, become administrative bodies rather than pedagogical sites. Yeah. Um, this is something again that, uh, um, this is something that, uh, this, Ivan Illich sort of talked about this with this notion of, of convivial tools. Would, would there be would there be ways in which we could use technology to connect um, to connect one another outside of outside of institutions? So I think that's very much possible. I think that that's what we see with learning on the web, learning on the open web. I don't mean learning in a in a MOOC necessarily, one of these sort of for profit MOOCs, but I think learning on the open web is is, is some of that. Um, I think that the pause I would give is that I think that um, I think that in some ways, although institutions can be greatly flawed, I think that in some ways institutions, um, education institutions in particular, do provide protections and access to people who might not necessarily have um, have opportunities outside of those institutions. So I think it's sort of it's difficult to sort of argue for the end for the end of academic institutions as much as sort of my sort of my baggage of being a, a graduate student sort of makes me sort of want to rail against the rail against the machine. I also think that there's um, that institutions can be a site for for equity and access in a way that I'm less confident that we're at a place right now to sort of naturally organize those things. So yes and yes and no. Ask the last question. So, um, you know, I, I know that I shouldn't ask you a question if I know the answer, but uh, um, what about if this conversation is not about technology, it's about ideology? Because technology empowers us, technology yeah. is around, we are technology. So, maybe if you could say more about that. Yeah. No, I think that this, I mean, I think that this absolutely is, is about ideology. I mean, I think that that's. This idea that um, this idea that somehow uh, that technology is not ideolo ideolo ideological um, is sort of strikingly odd to me, but also a strikingly powerful narrative right now within certain aspects um, of the technology sector, as though technology is natural, technology is inevitable, technology is always headed in the in the direction of progress, um, and I think that. Um, that's that's not the case. That's never the case. Technology is a reflection of culture and power and politics and and economics. And I think that the ideo the ideology of um, the ideology of certain disciplinary fields is is really interesting to me. And that's one of the reasons why I'm working on a book on teaching machines, for example. Is I'm I'm fascinated by by the development of that discipline. I'm fascinated by the way in which that di that discipline has sort of been connected to um, well, and more broadly, computer technology, computer sciences, is connected to militarism, is connected to imperialism. The roots that this field has that are we often sort of deny and argue, perhaps because of the advent of the web, that we sort of liberated ourselves from this other this other history. Of course, it it helps when Google buys a drone company and buys military robots that you can say, oh, see, like, this, this, this connects. But I think that, I mean, I do think that the technology is, is definitely ideological. And I think that that's why this question of labor is particularly important, too. Because how is labor viewed, how is labor viewed, you know, um, uh, today in, in, in our world? And, like, again, 
whose labor? Teacher's labor. How is that? How is that used? And I mean, that this is this is these are all deeply ideological. Um, one thing you might be interested in is that one of the places that this conversation is taking place uh, in reaction to what you just what you just said a recognition that this this drift that's taking the, the toward toward uh, uh, technologizing education is not just technologizing education but it's part of the whole trend toward the marketization of everything mm -hmm. including uh, including higher education uh, and education generally, that, or you know, what people in other countries call neoliberalism, uh, that one of the sort of headquarters of an alternative conversation is a thing called the Campaign for the Future of Higher Education, which uh, uh, is attempting to put forward an alternative vision of the future from what is coming out of the Gates Foundation and the Walton Foundation and the Luminas and the and the uh, broad. broad foundation, all you know, the, the whole yeah, list. The, list. <laughs> the, the guys who got more money than God, including more money than the U.S. government, and seem to run it these days, especially with regard to education policy. And that, uh, for for people interested, it's cfhe.org, uh, but uh, is coming from the faculty. Mm -hmm. And faculty organizations, and especially faculty unions, at the at the base level, not primarily the national unions, but from the base level, and especially out of California, and especially out of the California State University system, where people refused the MOOC, remember, and made that whole struggle just recently out of San Jose and other places, and uh, uh, so that conversation is taking place, and it's. Uh, uh, they put out a white paper on MOOCs, they put out a white paper on contingent faculty, they put out a white paper on community colleges that are available on the web and, and are trying to engage, they have biannual gatherings, one's going on back right now in, in Albany, uh, New York, and uh, uh, trying to push this conversation forward, but of course without the resources, either economic or political, that you know can get them on the front page every time they burp, like Bill Gates. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that is taking place, and it's interesting that the link is with, pe with the organization of the academic workforce. It's coming out of the faculty unions, mm -hmm. and very much conscious that the majority of the faculty are contingent faculty now, 75%, and that that's, for better or worse, that's, that's the future, in the immediate future, and that what those folks do is going gonna, is gonna to matter. And I, Wonder, I wonder if you're how much of this you're aware of, and what your reaction would be to, you know, comment on my little screed here. <laughs> no, I think that I mean I think that that's, that's right. I mean I think that one of the things that I find very striking is that the rhetoric, um, the rhetoric, particularly from the education technology, but the technology industry is sort of very apocalyptic when it comes to education. The education is something that we need to disrupt. The education is something that needs to be um, re redefined by um, uh, by the technology industry. I mean, I was I was uh, I thought that the the claim by Sebastian Thrun, for example, that in the future there will only be ten universities left in the world. Again, it's this very different vision. And it's a very different vision when you think about how students would experience 10 universities left in the world because of course the demand for education is rising off the charts there are two ways to solve that and that's one one of them is i think what john was said so we can train a lot more teachers we can develop a lot more teachers or we can dismantle the whole thing and automate it and standardize it and have you know the university of pearson and the university of google and Stanford. And some um, degrees. <laughs> and some degrees. Well, and license them, actually. You don't actually buy your degree. You have to keep paying, right? You have to keep paying on the subscription model. Right. But if you yeah. miss a payment, you, right, if you miss a payment, then you don't get to keep your, your degree any longer. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that, you know, I think that this, that I, I, mean, I, I think that this is something that is very much this sort of vision of what happens to these institutions. And I think it's no surprise that, you know, the sort of, 
in U.S. culture, at least, sort of the bastion of a very robust critique of, of sort of the current, the current ideology, robust critique of power comes from the institutions that are that folks are very interested in dismantling. And so, I mean, I think that this is this is a, there's a reason why it's education that's sort of the, is um, is on the, in the bullseye right now, and that's because I think that education helps. We uh, the professors have these arguments, but I think that um, university education, higher education in particular, helps equip our students to sort of develop these crit cr these criticisms as well. And I'm imagining that in the future of the University of Pearson, probably reading you know reading a little bit of Gramsci, reading a little bit of Asimov is not is is sort of not on the syllabus. So it, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that this is the target. Kaplan University already exists. Right. It's just down the street. Right. I noticed it as I was walking. Yeah. We have a final question from people online. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many comments, but most of them are not questions, such as approves. Or, uh, I want to say, uh, what is your take? Microphone. Use the mic, yeah. please. <laughs> what is your take on yeah. new Google LMS? <laughs> um, I, mean, I haven't seen the, So Google announced this week. Um, that it was launching a sort of a learning management system on top of Google Apps for Education. It's hard to comment because it, on how it works, its functionality, I haven't seen it yet. Um, on the other hand, I'm not necessarily surprised that Google would make make this um, je, uh, sort of make this venture into into education. Um, I have little interest in promoting Google products for people to use. I'd much rather people use um, education or use technologies that aren't based on um, data mining, um, that aren't based on using their data and selling it for advertising. I think that that's a particularly important thing that we should be helping students understand um, as well. Giving students sort of the digital, digital skills as well as the critical skills, but the digital, the critical digital skills so that they can resist some of these as well. Unfortunately, we're using Google Hangouts. <laughs> Thanks, Google. Uh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> we're going to take uh, 10 minutes if people want to have a coffee, and then we go to the second round.